Thank you, Nora, for joining me today. And I'd like to thank the folks at S&P Global for allowing you to spend some time with us to discuss these important topics related to U.S. public finance and environmental, social, and governance factors, or what are commonly referred to as ESG factors. I am Tom Kozik, the Head of Strategy and Credit at Hilltop Securities. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Today, we have Nora Wittstruck from S&P Global. Nora has been in different public finance credit and government roles throughout her career. Since 2016, she has been at S&P Global in the public finance group in New York City. Initially, she was hired into the state's team after working in Florida government. Now, Nora is all things ESG for S&P public finance. She is leading the ESG initiatives around market transparency. She is thought leadership when it comes to public finance and S&P Global. She is also responsible for analytical education. In other words, she is the one who explains to investors and issuers and others how ESG themes impact S&P's rating criteria. And we will also ask Nora how often ESG factors impact, actually impact those public finance credit ratings uh, during our discussion. Uh, but I just wanted to take the time again to thank Nora and say that sounds like a very big job. Uh, we appreciate you taking time out today to speak to us. Thanks, Tom. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'm always excited to talk about ESG and you know my background. As you mentioned, I've sat in a lot of seats in the public finance world. And right now I happen to sit in a credit rating agency. Um, but I have worked for issuers. I've worked for Hilltop for a brief time in my life. And, you know, I started my career working at the city of Richardson in Texas. So great to talk to you today. Thank you. Right near where I am in uh, in, in uh, North Dallas, Texas as well. Yes. So as you, as you mentioned, we're going to talk about ESG and how it factors into credit quality at S&P's public finance transparency efforts and the recent S&P request for comment that was released for the ESG principles-based criteria. But first, I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to actually answer my own first question, and I'm going to <laughs> turn the question around back to you. But I wanted to just kind of answer, ask generally, why is this, why is ESG important to, to public finance investors and public finance uh, entities and state local governments? And I think that you know, over the last few years, themes related to ESG or environmental, social, and governance factors or themes, they've really gained a, a strengthening or a, uh, an increased importance to investors. Uh, I think that uh, it's investors who are saying to us that they'd like to have more of a positive impact on their world, and they believe that they can do that through sustainable investing and by considering these ESG-related themes. Personally, this really hit me at the beginning of 2020 when I was participating in a GFOA or Government Finance Officers webinar titled Rating and Market Outlook. Uh, this is the, I think it was, if I remember correctly, the beginning of 2020, January, to be specific. And there was a representative from each of the rating agencies and myself participating. And the majority of the time was spent by the folks at the rating agencies discussing their approach to ESG factors and specifically uh, exposure and threats related to cybersecurity, climate risk, and other risks, especially those related to infrastructure. Also, that month in January of 2020, BlackRock CEO Larry Fick not only made sustainable investing a central tenant to his firm's allocation strategy, but CEO Fick also said that he expects these trends to impact and change the municipal bond market specifically. He said, I do believe this is going to change the municipal bond market. Areas that are more impacted by climate change are going to have a harder time financing their debt if they do not focus on the impact of climate change in their district, in their region, or in their cities. And uh, COVID-19 did not slow interest in ESG. A record 51 billion was invested in ESG funds in 2020, more than double the amount compared to the year before. So I hope that I gave a little bit of an overview broadly about why it is that ESG is important to investors and state local governments. Nora, I'm gonna now pose that question to you. Why do you, why is it that you and S&P Global believes that ESG is so important? 
Well, Tom, I think you set the table as to why it's important to S&P Global and why it should be important to issuers and other market participants. And that's because investors are very interested in ESG. And, you know, I think we'll talk about it a little bit later, but the world of ESG is multifaceted. So I'm going to specifically talk more about how it affects credit quality. You mentioned sustainable investing. That's a, that's a whole nother aspect of ESG, which is slightly different. And that talks about sort of how bonds are labeled in the market, whether it's G, green bonds or social bonds. But from our perspective, we have been looking at ESG credit factors through our sector level criteria always. Um, most of our criteria within USPF has some form of demographic or economic analysis that contributes to the rating um, in state and local governments. Obviously, debt service is paid from most of the time, property taxes, and when E factors or S factors could hinder a government's ability to collect those taxes, that can have an impact on credit quality. And I think investors are beginning to think about that as well, not only because they have a certain mission that they might want to accomplish, but also because it's it's affecting credit quality and they want to make sure that they hold paper where there's not a lot of rating volatility. So the transparency efforts have really ramped up over the last couple of years as a result of feedback from investors that we've received. And, you know, with some of that, we've published commentaries, we have introduced specific ESG paragraphs within our issuer level rationales. And all of that is introduced to make investors and market participants aware of risks or opportunities that could affect credit quality. Okay. Okay. And just, uh, I want to be clear for the listeners who are not uh, familiar, when you said USPF, you were oh. referring to the United States Public Finance Group of S&P Global, correct? That's right. That's right. I'm so sorry. Okay. Yes. U- okay. U.S. Public okay. Finance at S&P Global. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But I, I mean, think generally, yeah, the public finance market uh, is obviously outside of uh, outside of S&P, but generally, you know, market participants within public finance. I mean, it's an important distinction to make, too, because as we were uh, talking the other day, there was an S&P global report that I was uh, reading and talking. We were talking about, but that did not come out of uh, public finance. It came out of the corporate side. So it, it is an important distinction, not only to define, but to make. Right. And I think I think that's another interesting aspect of ESG in that corporates have been further ahead on these issues because of the sort of stakeholder analysis that they do relative to the financial position of the corporations that they that they rate. In addition to that, a lot of corporations are global. And I think, you know, the EU in particular, Europe is much further ahead on these types of concerns than the U.S. in that regard. So I think it came to corporates maybe a lot sooner than we're necessarily seeing um, it percolate in the public finance world, but it's definitely accelerating um, for our issuers and for market participants here. So then how is it that S&P's public finance group considers and like specifically defines ESG? Well, they're defined as, you know, environmental governance and social dimensions that can affect an issuer's ability to pay their obligations in full and on time. So within the environment, we're talking about physical risks associated with severe weather events or environmental transition risk relative to transitioning to a net zero emissions policy We're also talking about, you know, social demographic factors uh, that can affect your ability to raise revenue, population trends, those types of things. And then in governance, a lot of it in governance um, for the public finance market is around your ability to mitigate those emerging risks 
and plan for them, not only within your financial profile, but also potentially within your capital plan as well, if that's a requirement that you have a number of capital projects associated with hardening your infrastructure assets, or maybe you have to build a lot of schools because you have a lot of population growth, things of that nature. So how is it that then you can take those very, very big picture ideas and themes and integrate them into the public finance criteria that is used to uh, finalize a rating. Uh, and, I, and I know that I'm sure this is something that has not just taken weeks or months, but you know, years of analysis and meetings, but is there, a, is there an easy way to kind of generalize or answer that question? I wouldn't say there's an easy way, but I will say it's something that we've been thinking about, you know, for a very long time, which is why we have articulated to the market that it's always been captured within our criteria. We may have been talking about them differently in different terms, but now we're sort of translating that to ESG. So, for example, within our utilities criteria, you know, it's we have an operational management assessment, which has always looked at uh, a utility's supply diversity, particularly when it comes to power generation and you know how the utilities are planning their infrastructure for transitioning to renewable energy versus you know carbon-based uh, energy. And then also how they mitigate, particularly in California, around wildfire risk, because that's a serious issue for California issuers in general, but also for utilities because it presents certain risks associated with their ability to operate effectively. So all of that has always been captured there. And now if, for example, we take a rating action, an outlook change or a rating change relative to those factors, we're now articulating that as an environmental risk that changed the rating. So are there, is there, is there a specific section and specific mention of this in every single S&P public finance report? Is that something that investors and or public finance entities can expect to see uh, addressed in every single uh, published analysis going forward? Absolutely. And we introduced okay. that last year um, in mm -hmm. the end of March of 2020 is when we started implementing these dedicated paragraphs. And right now, the way we're articulating the risks is sort of relative to the sector norm, um, which mm -hmm. can mean a whole host of things. But for the most part, a lot of our large entities, states and states in particular, let's just take them as an example, we find these risks and opportunities to be relatively neutral for credit quality because they're very sophisticated entities that can have a lot of tools in their toolbox to manage their financial operations, to manage their ability to you know, maintain budgetary balance. And so you know, we don't see those risks necessarily crystallizing at this point at, absent a credit event. For example, in Texas, you know, in February with the very cold weather, that's an abnormal situation for Texas issuers to operate within. And it did have a credit effect on a number of utilities who were not effectively hedging their supply from ERCOT and you know, had very large liabilities associated with the power that they had to utilize during that period of time. So, you know, those are the types of things that we're trying to articulate to the market through our issuer level research. Okay, okay. So one of the things that I wanted to get into was the June 3rd, 2021 S&P report it was uh, titled ESG Brief Emerging Themes in U.S. Public Finance. Yes. Uh, it just came out. And in the brief, you indicate that S&P is watching I mean, the energy transition risks, social justice, acute physical risks, risk management strategies, and transparency and disclosure. Uh, I really, I want to specifically focus in on the energy transition risk and the social justice categories. I was wondering if you could 
uh, describe the specific items that really contribute to those two themes specifically? Absolutely. So, and thanks for mentioning the report. Uh, as the author, I, I love it when people talk about it, um, maybe self-interested uh, wise, but we think that these risks obviously were, were always apparent, but there tends to be in our mind sometimes events that crystallize the risk or make it a bit more material for credit quality that might give issuers, let's just say, less headroom at their rating category. So for energy transition risk, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we've always been capturing supply diversity and how a management team at a utility is managing their infrastructure requirements to, you know, move towards more renewable energy. But Really, with the federal policy shift and Biden's administration, this risk is a lot more material for the utility sector than we've probably Mm -hmm. seen in the recent past. And even if, let's just say, Biden's administration, you know, is a four year administration because of the Paris Agreement and because of a lot of the initiatives within the EU for transitioning to a net zero emissions policy, we think that this is going to accelerate the trend in the U.S. And so this has been an issue we've been watching. It's becoming a lot more material to credit quality in our views as a result of those aspects um, at the federal level in particular. And we, you know, articulate in a number of ways how we look at transition risk and how we capture it in our analysis. And in state and local governments in particular, our economic analysis really looks at how much economic growth or economic activity is generated by the energy sector. And if there is a move, a significant move away from coal-producing entities, how that can affect budgetary balance. So places like Wyoming and Alaska, who rely heavily to fund their budget from you know, royalties from the energy industry, if there's a change to a larger renewable energy sector, how will Wyoming and Alaska sort of adapt to uh, that change as well and figure out other ways potentially to fund their budget? So that's one way we look at it. We also, you know, look at it. Obviously, we mentioned how we look at it in utilities and even in not-for-profit healthcare. We're looking at it because these are entities and systems that have a very large physical footprint, and they are going to have to figure out ways to reduce their energy consumption. And healthcare is an industry where there is a lot of energy consumption based on the equipment and other things that they have to uh, rely on to to do their business. I was just going to say, and on the social justice side, that's something that I actually just published a piece. I mean, I was was focusing on uh, recent data and recent trends that, well, recent, a trend that shifted just a couple years ago with violent crime. Uh, Yes. How does, how does the social, yeah, how does social, the social justice themes and and that kind of data, how does that play into what is it you're watching on it where ESG is concerned? Absolutely. So as I think you mentioned in your commentary, there was a fairly significant shift in the way we look at social justice that was evidenced by the murder of George Floyd and the community's reaction to that, the Black Lives Matter movements, um, other, you know, racial, um, social unrest that was the was an outcome of that event. And I think it's very important to be thinking about this, not only from sort of a humanity perspective, but also because it can affect credit quality. For example, we actually changed the outlook on Minneapolis where George Floyd died because there was a legal settlement that they had to pay the family of George Floyd. It was $28 million. And although that liability may not be something that the city had to completely absorb through their reserve position, they might have um, insurance or something else that could offset a portion of the lawsuit. 
but we've viewed that as being a credit event for them in terms of that liability. And we also feel like some events like that could lead to reputational risk and can, will Minneapolis be less able to attract and retain businesses for businesses who are watching these types of events and if they want to participate or not, or locate their operations in a community that might be viewed as having some issues surrounding this, or if they don't want to locate there because the government is not actively addressing the unrest that came as a result of this event. So all of that can affect economic profiles and it can affect financial profiles. From a governance perspective, our management teams looking forward and trying to make changes to their operations relative to these risks, are they actively changing policing pro policies, if that's something that they're looking at, you know, that could stem social unrest and, and be a better engagement with the community relative to changes in their operations. So I think it's an emerging risk. I don't think that we've seen a lot of rating changes relative to social justice yet, but it's definitely something that our corporate counterparts are looking at, which you mentioned in your commentary. And I think it's definitely something that is coming up more and more with management teams on calls with issuers as well. It sounds like one of the things that I was going to follow up with was how realistic these threats were and how immediate they were. And you've answered that. I mean, they are absolutely realistic and they are immediate right i mean they are here now these are not the types of things that uh i mean there are certain things you know as you're describing um there are certain things from a policy perspective that as uh, changes uh potentially evolve in dc uh, those things might have may take a little bit of time but it's not a you know five or ten year horizon it's a you know it's a horizon that could be measured in months and where the social justice items that you're talking about, those threats have already started to uh, flow through. So thank you for that. That was a great description. Yeah, so I think you, are there? You're right. Yeah. I was just gonna say you're right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so specifically, uh, you so you mentioned Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. What other upgrades, the downgrades, or even upgrades have occurred specifically? Because I'd have to imagine that if there are, as you were describing, if there are situations where entities have you know not not only recognized and acknowledged but then uh taken action they're very well i would imagine there could be a situation where there are upgrades but could you give us an idea of the upgrade and downgrade activity that's occurred uh, on esg related themes recently sure absolutely so i will make mention of the fact that monthly we publish an article called the esg pulse that looks at all of the ESG-driven rating actions across all of our ratings practices. So corporates, sovereigns and international public finance, public finance, insurance banks, structured finance. There's a, it's a combined article that captures all of them. And obviously in 2020, because of the health and safety social risk that stemmed from the pandemic, there were a lot of uh, social risk driven rating actions. I think there were 743 for the United States public finance team at S&P alone, just associated with the pandemic. More recently, we mentioned the situation in Texas with the extreme cold weather that to us is a physical risk and we've changed the rating actually a number of times on several utilities within Texas that were associated with that heightened environmental risk. Through the end of May in this year, we've taken about 88 rating actions associated with ESG, uh, a pretty even split between governance driven actions and environmental driven actions. We still have some sectors in public finance that are lingering in terms of the health and safety social risk from the pandemic, which is mostly with uh, student housing and how those projects were affected by, you know, the inability to have students in them last year, potential issues with leasing them up this upcoming year, things like that. So we did see 
a number of rating actions in that sector related to COVID. And it tends to be that those are hanging on a bit uh, into 2021 as well. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. That's, uh, uh, I think, and I'm glad that you mentioned the uh, the ESG uh, Pulse Report. I think that's a, that could be an important reference for folks. Uh, I'd like to thank Nora one last time. Nora, thank you for joining us today. This has been a, uh, I think we're going to look at this as an introduction to ESG. I think that you and I should talk here in another couple of uh, months, then we can talk about what, it, you know, how things have evolved since uh, we've spoken today. Uh, but again, I want to thank you for joining us today. This has been very informative for me and I'm sure for everyone listening. Thanks, Tom. I really appreciate the time and having the opportunity to speak to you. Thanks again.